dogs and they're playing poker. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's The Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and while everyone else is at the mall, hopefully you're having fun at home with your family. And what's more fun than a board game? A couple of things come to mind, Joe. Okay, fine. All right, I'll just read it. On today's show, as we do on this day every year, we're launching into the top five games to get you interested in money, economics, and finance with our special guests, Kniff, Rippy, and Jordan from the board game podcast, The No Cube Zone. They'll also share the top games to play with your family this holiday season. Don't get caught in the trap of wasting your good money on a crappy game because the cover looks cool. Plus, during our Friday FinTech segment, we're welcoming the game company that also happens to be the sixth fastest growing company in America. Who would have thought that games could be so lucrative? To tell us all about To Hunt a Killer, we welcome co-founder Ryan Hogan and vice president of creative Derek Smith. And now, a guy who doesn't know the first thing about games, it's Joe Salciha. I don't know the first thing about games, but I know the last thing about games, and that is that they are fun. Hey, everybody, welcome to Friday, Black Friday for everybody else. But for you and I, it's going to be Board Game Friday because, and we started this tradition a while ago, well, before I even talk about the tradition, Let's get the guy on the mic, who's usually on Friday, part of our roundtable, usually my co-host. Today, back in the co-host spot for this special episode, Mr. OG. How are you, man? Happy Thanksgiving, belatedly. Thank you. Thank you. I am full of pie. We talked about this. You don't like pumpkin pie. Okay. I said I do like pumpkin pie. American. I mean, we had communist you, pig. You, Mrs. OG, Cheryl, and I had this discussion, and your head like whipped around. You said, you don't like pumpkin pie? And we clarified for you right at the restaurant. I like pumpkin pie. I just like apple pie better. You're saying the same thing in different words. I don't like pumpkin pie. That you don't make pumpkin pie in, you know, June. You can make an apple pie in June. I rarely have pie. Rarely. It doesn't leave enough room for wine. Well, that's true. You got to save room for the important stuff. I'm going to break the mold. I think next year because we have like, I don't want to break the news. Breaking news here, everybody. But there's five weeks left in the year. It doesn't look like this stuff's ending on the 31st. So I think next year for my quarantine plan, I'm just going to make pumpkin pie in random times throughout the year. And just say, I'm thankful. Yes. <laughs> well, no, or just eat pie. One of the two. Just, just, just remembering that you're thankful. We got a great show today. We have the guys from the No Cube Zone joining us. A very fun board game podcast. These guys are going to share with us top games to help you get on the path uh, to learning about money, about business, not games that teach you, but games that just build the thirst. And then they're also going to help us, you know, around the holiday season, OG, people head to Target and they just look at the board games because that's about the one time a year a lot of families play games and they make awful choices. So while we have the board game nerds here, we have to talk to them. We have to beg them to tell us what we should be playing. And, uh, and these guys will know. They will definitely know. And their show's a lot of fun. No Cube Zone guys first. And then we're going to talk to the creator of one of the fastest companies, according to Inc. in America. Sixth fastest company. It happens to be a game company. They make a game that you can play with your family. It's a subscription service called To Hunt a Killer. Do, do you get the Facebook ads for To Hunt a Killer? Uh, I don't go on Facebook, so nope. <laughs> that is so smart of you, my friend. I would love to not go on Facebook. But I'm generally at the basement chatting with our friends there. And I see To Hunt a Killer ads and electric bike ads nonstop. Well, because those guys know that you uh, shop for those things. What's crazy about it is I've already bought one and they're still showing me those ads. I wish I could say, already bought one. No, thank you. But I can't. Anyway, we're going to talk to people to create To Hunt a Killer as well. So let's dive on in. (music) 
and I'm super happy on my dad shortwave radio. We have the three gentlemen behind the no cube zone podcast. The only podcast, by the way, on earth that has twilight zone logo <laughs> art. <laughs> it's, it's just my new friends, Jordan Cuddiff and Rippy guys. How are you? Great. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm fantastic. And so everybody knows uh, the voices so we can get the voices right. Rippy, I always feel like on your show, you're always the third person to talk. So we're going to make you the first person to talk here. Oh, boy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about how you got involved in board games. Like, how did you how did this become a hobby for you? Gosh, that was, I think, probably about what five, six years ago was home from I lived in Illinois up there for a couple of years, came home. My brother had uh, I'm trying to think. Betrayal. That's what it was. Yeah. Betrayal. At Betrayal. The house a house on the hill. A good yeah. Halloween game. Exactly. Right. And uh, so I had never even touched anything like this. We played it instantly. I was like, okay, this is sweet. He told me the place he got it was called Board Game Warehouse. Rest in peace. Um, This place was a legit warehouse (laughs) of board games at like a fraction of the cost of like even at Amazon. Wait a minute. It was was local? Like you walked into this store? Yeah. So it was was like in between if you're in Southwest Missouri – between Nixon and Ozark, just kind of out in the middle of nowhere, almost. You just walk up, and I remember the first time I, I knocked on the door, I was like, is this board game warehouse? Like, oh, yeah, yeah, come in. They had just like a little front uh, with like games and stuff, and he's like, oh, he's like, well, you want to see the rest of them? I was like, sure. Again, it sounds like, never- Rippy, it sounds like, I'm no offense, but it sounds like you're going to get drugs. Like, you got to know oh, the yeah. right knock. <laughs> Right. <laughs> you got to give I them the password. <laughs> yes. It, I felt really weird. Cause I had never, I hadn't bought any board games. I hadn't done, you know, anything. And so he like opens this door and Conniff can attest to this cause he's been there and it's just shelf after shelf after shelf after shelf of just board games in a big old warehouse. And so you, he's like, yeah, just take a look around see if there's anything you like. And so of course, you know, I'm a poor at this point and I don't have any money, but I'm like, I got to do it. And so I think I bought, I don't even remember what games I bought, but I bought two or three games. And from then on, it was just hook, line and sinker for me. Yeah. Just being able to, because I I grew up playing video games. That was, you know, my life. You didn't play board games games as a kid or anything. I mean, we played, you know, the, the typical monopoly, sorry, card games, stuff like that. Phase 10. Once you taste what is actually like in the board game hobby now, that stuff is just like child's play. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I played that all that time and all of this was out there. So yeah, so I basically just got into playing it. I was a youth pastor for a while up in when I lived in Illinois. And so it was just a good way to connect with my teens and play with them and give them something like different than, you know, even just video games. Uh, well, that's, that's what I like. I, into it. I mean, it's kind of like when you're sitting on, on a sofa playing game, but you know, video games of people, cause they're, it's, it's collective. You're sharing this experience mm-hmm. of people. And you're laughing about it together. I mean, I I can totally see a youth group getting into board games together. Oh, yeah. It was a blast. So ever since then, that's where all my money has gone in life (laughs) is to board games. He's like, forget about uh, forget about 401k. (laughs) 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 Then we'll get that to that later. Uh, Let's say hi to the person you'll hear second on a lot of shows. It's our friend Jordan. Man, how are you? I'm doing well, Joe. Uh, thanks for having us. I, I'm rocking my uh, my Stacking Benjamins shirt tonight. I was so surprised. We, we have the only shortwave radio that has video. And when you popped on the screen with that very sexy t-shirt, I was impressed. <laughs> hey, I, not only do you think it's sexy, but my wife seemed to think so too when I put <laughs> it on. So I can only say thank you to... <laughs> You, OG, Gertrude, whoever put this thing together, (laughs) thank you. Yeah, as far as board games for me, I did have some board games when I was a kid. Had like the standard fare, like Monopoly and those. I remember one game I had was called Dungeon Dice. Came out in 1979. In the game, you were rolling these dice to try and like burrow out of a dungeon. Like you were a prisoner and you were trying to escape the dungeon. And there were, yeah, you played these cards out and... Like there were, you would run into like knights who would like capture you and send you back or something. I don't know, but I, I loved playing games. I would set up my Star Wars Monopoly and leave it out there for days and like, oh, let's play some more. <laughs> and I think my parents would just be like, oh, fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, we don't need the kitchen table. 
We right, don't. Yeah. <laughs> no, nothing important to do there. Yeah. And then uh, fast forward a little bit. When I got married, I actually, my wife's family introduced me to hobby board games. Wow. Uh, they had Ticket to Ride. And I sat down and I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Speaking of Rippy and knocking on the door of Board Game Warehouse and having to give the password and stuff and me making the drug joke, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> the gateway drug of board gaming for a lot of yeah. people is Ticket to Ride. Mm -hmm. It really is. Yeah, so that was what got me into it. And then some of my wife's friends that I'm now friends with their husbands, the husbands were into board games and we used to get together to watch a show i think it was like the walking dead on sunday nights and like we'd get together and we'd just sit there and talk board games i don't even remember what happened on the tv <laughs> show but we would just talk about board games the entire time and i just i've went down the rabbit hole since that's super fun man i just and once again i love the community aspect of that and getting mm -hmm. together and having fun. I'll tell you, I can't mm -hmm. wait for it till COVID's over. Cause now that I've yeah. moved back to Texarkana, this group of friends I have here, well, even my friends in Detroit, when I lived there, just getting a bunch of people together. And it's funny hearing them talk about games because people will say they're like, Oh, do you, is it like monopoly? Well, <laughs> yeah, kind of a little bit, right. They're, mm -hmm. they're generally easy and they're fun. And they're like, but, but no. And they'll go, well, is it Dungeons and Dragons? And we're usually like at my age, we're like, I don't have time for that. I just, right. <laughs> it is, it is just way too long. Can't, can't do that. Like, mm -hmm. well, what is it? And then, and then a friend of mine said, he goes, well, it's usually just an excuse for friends to get together and drink. And we usually don't remember who wins <laughs> and we laugh a lot. If it says 90 minutes on the game, that means it's probably three hours for us. Right? Right. <laughs> like we'll, we'll take way too long. That's awesome. And the person who you hear first on most shows, which is why we'll have him last on this show, but the guy who drives the No Cube Zone podcast, it's our new friend, Conniff. How are you, man? I am doing well, Joe. The reason you hear me first, I think I should throw this caveat out, is because I'm the one who edits the podcast, so I have all the power <laughs> right. to make that Takes call, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> he holds the reins to no, the I whole podcast. Say, I got to say, Joe, when Jordan told me that you wanted us on your show, I was like, Jordan, I don't know if I have the intelligence for this. Like, I'm just some some board gamer that sits at his computer for too long and works day in and day out. But, uh, but no, I'm happy to be here and happy to talk board games and all things that really this hobby that has been a big part of my life for the past five years i think rippy and i got into it about the same yeah, time and so. the board game warehouse stuff it's it's all true it it's was a, a warehouse they so had you, a little so a wait a minute front. wait a second yeah. though kind of did rippy tell you you had to go to the board game warehouse with him because he was afraid of like when he knocked on that door what was really in there <laughs> No, no, no. Rippy doesn't have any fear when it comes to <laughs> board games and stuff like that. It's like the seductress just sitting there yeah. calling to him and he just he you just went. Give in. And so he he did the legwork. He was the one who cleared it on being a, a drug sort of cover and and I went after the fact and uh, separately. And I think back then I, I had to take a sick day to be able <laughs> to go because their hours times. were right during my working hours. Well, it was, it was interesting, uh, interesting life back then, 2015 <laughs> playing hooky so, to go buy board games. But yeah, am I, am I, absolutely. So aside from board game warehouse, my, like, if we go back to my childhood, I played, I had this old Jurassic park game. There was this game. It was, uh, labyrinth one, but then there was this like mechanical game that had what would now be like a 3d printed board. And it had a giant pit in the middle and there was a mechanized monster, if you will. And it would spin around in the circular board and it would have this hand come out. And for those who can see this, which is nobody the, except the, for the three of us. Yeah. On the call. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm mimicking this hand reaching out of this plastic fake slime that the monster is sitting in. And it basically goes onto the board and pulls into like this pit and it, that's the whole point of the game. I think it was called It from the Pit or It and the Pit, the Monsters, It, something, It. It's, <laughs> but it's it like fun. a... It was, uh, it was one of those games as a child you play and just 
you know, there's no substance to it at all. But. It's, it sounds a little kind of like a scary version of Hungry Hippos, except instead of the hippo yeah. eating it, you got the hand yeah. with slime eating it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys have been yeah. nice enough. Well, that's a good, that's a good call. <laughs> you guys have been nice enough to agree to help me with five games that will help money geeks, maybe just get interested in money. Now I'll give everybody kind of the rules that I gave the, the no cube zone guys here, which is that we're not really interested in games that teach people about money. Cause most of the games I know that teach people try to teach people are absolutely horrible games. What I really want are just games that build the thirst so that you'll look at it later. I know that there's some games that you guys talk about on your podcast. I won't mention them because you guys might bring them up later, but there's some games you mentioned that really don't teach you about the stock market or don't teach you about how to have a vineyard, but you do those things and then you get interested in how it all works or maybe how you build a utility grid or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. So how do you run a business? How do you manage money? Whatever that thing is. You guys have come up of, with five of those. So, Jordan, you want to do the honors? What's the first game that uh, our money geeks, our stackers should pay attention to to maybe have some fun with cash? Yeah, so the first game that we picked, and I say we is in the royal we. Um, <laughs> if you listen to the, uh, the No Cube Zone, you know that uh, I, I play more games than the other guys. So I, no. I did a little well, bit of the heavy lifting on this part. But. Well, and let's be clear about why, Jordan. So, so kind of how long ago did you guys have a baby? Friday. <laughs> Four days ago is the answer. <laughs> Yeah, so so yeah. when when this comes out a week and a half ago, that that's congratulations, man. Yeah, thank you. Have you heard Jim Gaffigan his joke about the third kid, or maybe it's the fourth kid? No. All of a sudden, we're gonna go with the uh, <laughs> absolutely just true. <laughs> Want to know what it's like to have four kids? Just imagine you're drowning, right. and then someone hands you a baby. He did. I love that one. <laughs> yeah, that's good. And that right there is why I kind of plays board games just to get yep. away. And by the way, Rippy, you have kids too. There's either a baby on the way I, I've heard, or there's uh, one that just happened. I don't know. Yes, you heard correctly. We have one on the way. We actually just had like our, our first final doctor's appointment today. So we've got about a little less than four weeks until the due date. So yeah, third one's coming. Real wow. Quick. So that's your third as well. Yeah. You and Connor, if like you guys are racing. We're just wrong. Oh, the Connors Connors will definitely win this race. Absolutely, we will. (laughs) All right, Jordan. So the Royal We, the dude who plays games on this podcast. The the Royal, the Royal We, we picked the Estates. I've never heard of this game. Tell me about this game. The Estates, it came out in 2018 and is published by Capstone Games. So in the Estates, you are playing as developers of like a subdivision well there's three subdivisions or streets that are going to get built out in that but only two of them are actually going to be finished like the contract from the city is only for two to be finished but you're building three so whatever streets don't get finished anything that you've built in that is negative points it's like you've invested your money there and you lose your money and then um, anything in the, the streets that do get completed are positive points. So there are six different companies. There's gray, yellow, red, purple, blue, green. There are just auctions that go around. You're buying the cubes to place out. The first person to buy any of the colors becomes like the owner of, the, of that company. So if you are the first to buy the red cubes, you are the owner of the red company. But anyone can win the auction if you're willing to pay the money and then they get to pick where it goes so Uh, someone could if rippy owns the purple company i could buy that purple cube and put it on a on a road that looks like it's not going to finish and then all of a sudden he has to care about that road so Um, so as different people rest control of the game (laughs) you're really fighting with each other and deciding (laughs) when to bid and when not to bid so and it's a closed economy as far as the money there's Every person starts with, uh, they're in millions. So everyone person person starts with $12 million and there's an option at the start of your turn to tuck one of your bills under the board. That'll count as a positive point at the end of the game, but then you're removing that from the economy. I wish by the way, life was like that. Everybody starts with $12 million. 
<laughs> yep. You just welcome, welcome. Let's Here's your twelve over. million dollars. Spend it wisely. I did have to be careful picking this game because it's chuck full of cubes, and on a show called the No Cubes, yeah, Club, you're, you're liable to lose your host seat picking a game like this. That's, I'm glad you cracked the joke before me because that was the elephant in the room right there. I'm like, what cubes? Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I know. I it's know. Violating they're, your they're, own rules. They're already. building pieces in the theme of the game. They're building pieces. They're not just bland generic cubes. Yeah. Um, but I like this right. idea of auctions because especially for teenagers and younger people like this, this give and take, like the idea that you have to give and take with other people, I think is a nice social lesson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you, you kind of have to decide on, am I going to let this go even though I really want it? Because again, it's one of those games, if you run out of money, then it, things get kind of tight on you if you, if you don't have the cash to pick up more cubes. I did forget to mention each person takes turns being the auctioneer. So you choose what gets put up for auction. So you can really feel this wrestling mm -hmm. for control. This yeah. yeah, there are a few fun pieces as well that you can put up for auction. There are pieces that will either extend the length of a road to have it completed or shorten the length of a road to have it completed. And then there's a mayor's hat, which will double. Well, it'll be, it's a times two multiplier for the street which can apply to positive and negative. Um, I've seen games where everyone ends in the hole. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You start with $12 million and nobody has anything at the end. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's, there's some real life people have lived that one too. Some of the lottery yep. winners out there. Let's go to number four then. Well, I, I'm doing these like, I don't know why I'm doing the, the countdown thing when it's really not a countdown, but number two, number four, whichever we want it to be. Can we get uh, Doug's voice in there to do the countdown? <laughs> no, that's us? what we totally need. We usually have this <laughs> British guy that does it, but yeah, today you're stuck with me. <laughs> so the next game that I picked is one that we talked about a little bit before we started recording. It's Pan Am. Mm -hmm. So Pan Am yes. themed after the now defunct airline company. It's set in the late twenties, early thirties when Pan Am started so you're playing f as one of four airline companies on a map of the world, and you're trying to get acquired by Pan Am. The winner of the game is the person who ends the game with the most shares of Pan Am stock. Pan Am starts in Miami and expands out from there. At the end of every round, there's a die that gets rolled that'll show on which which route that Pan Am expands. It's either going to expand along like the Asia Pacific route, the South America route, or the like the North America to Europe route. And so you're you're trying to get bought by Pan Am because they're going to pay out big money for those routes, and then you have more money to buy shares of Pan Am. Rippy and Cuniff, have you guys played this game? Nope. I have not, but this is, so as we talked about once before on our show, I am the type of person I can look at a game and if the theme is interesting to me, I'm all on board. So this is one where I love the concept of air travel. Like, so I work for Expedia, so I am in the travel industry as, you know, a professional. And so looking at this and, and just seeing and again I, I like things that look good just just the way i am with board games and so i see all these little miniature airplanes and uh the way the map is designed where it's a it's a north pole view of the world so you're looking from the north pole as it would if it were spread out plus jordan goes on about this all the time just to how it's got a very very tight fitting mechanism and just overall it's it's simpler than some of the games that jordan's into and so i'm like that's an instant sell for me so maybe a listener who is like you know may, might be interested in a game but doesn't want to dive into something that's extremely complex this is often been touted by many people in the board game industry as being a more beginner friendly game especially with a sort of financial or bidding or stock sort of theme to echo everything that you said kind of the fact that it's available at target you don't find a lot of games that mm, the four yeah. of us like at target i bought it two weeks ago 
Cheryl was in a really bad mood, my spouse, but my son and I insisted on teaching her the game that night because, you know, we're trying to make her mad. I don't know why. <laughs> but, but we should we should have backed off. It was a bad night teacher game. But a third of the way through the game, kind of, she goes, I love this game. Just yeah. the history yep. of Pan Am, you get just a little flavor of. They don't shove it in, in your face. Not like a history mm-hmm. lesson. But the game begins, uh, Jordan, like you said, when Pan Am begins and it ends when the founder retires, uh, either retires or dies. I think he retires. Uh, Mm -hmm. So it follows that and Pan Am is going. And there's also this little bit of headbender that's really cool where, you know, in a game like Monopoly, you're trying to take over the world. In this game, you're trying to, as fast as you can, get all your roots purchased so that you can get money, so you can buy shares in that stock. It's like you and I going, come on, Amazon, acquire me, you know? <laughs> buy me up. That's right. <laughs> please, please, Spotify, buy our right. podcast, you know? <laughs> right. So that we can be part of the mothership. And it's, I, I, I don't know, I'll tell you what happened in our game, and I don't know in Jordan and yours how it went, but we, we played it once. We had a three-way tie, and then we, oh, wow. we, yeah, my son roared. To, uh, I got off at a great start. Uh, Cheryl played a very consistent game. Nick had this roaring last turn that just brought him to it. And it ended up coming down to the tiebreaker. My wife and I still tied. So, which is also why she liked it because she won. So, <laughs> but, but uh, I think Pan Am is a great pick. And the fact that everybody listening can get it at Target, I think. And it's about half the price of a lot of the games we play. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's I think I'm going to right invoke the uh, the Homer Simpson nerd quote here, but I actually I have an app on my phone that I track my plays on, so I have a hold nerdy on. thing that I do. Hold on. Wait. Wait. Thing. Wait. Hold on. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I love it. I but it Jordan coming. knows that means you're one of our people. So. Yeah. (laughs) So, yeah, I I keep track of the games I play, who I play them with. It's just, again, a fun, nerdy thing that it's like a sub hobby of this hobby that I do. (laughs) But yeah, that I have a play that I played with four people and the scores, the person who won had 23 shares and me and last had 21. Yeah. Like, oh, wow. A four player game. Like it was it was that close. So it it is a close game. No one's ever like out of it. It's not like a, like a monopoly or something like that, where you are just trudging on (laughs) to to face defeat at the end. Yeah. No, not hard to learn. Everybody's in it the whole way. You have to pay attention to what everybody else does. So you're not just sitting around waiting for your turn. Yeah. Great pick. What's our number three. So the third game I picked is a game called modern art. We've had this this on the list in past years as well. I love modern art. It was so it was originally published in 1992. There's lots of different versions Jeez. of the game out there because different publishers have picked it up around the world. Because in this niche hobby of board games, there are not many big global companies. So there's like <laughs> regional companies that publish games. So you get different publishers with different art styles. So that's fun. So I think this one's really interesting because with modern art, none of the art has any inherent value, just like real art. It's just based on it's again, it's based on there are different auctions and there are like four different types of auction. There's like a, where you, everyone closes their fist and puts their money in the middle in their hand and then like reveals it all at the same time. There's just the standard, just keep bidding until the highest person till everyone else drops out. There's the, just go around the table and just like starts with, Rippy, he'll say his bid. Conniff can either say bid higher or pass. And then if it gets back to Rippy, no one's outbid him. He gets it. But there are these different artists that you're you're bidding on their artwork, trying to have enough of those artists' piece of art be bought so that then that artist's art is valuable. Yeah, the more the more of those pieces that get bought, the more value that artist has as as the game goes on. So some artists become hot and other artists are really not so the house rule that we always play with is when you are because you are you have a hand of the pieces of art that you choose so you run the auction as sometimes as like a, a, the auctioneer when you put up a piece of art as the auction you have to tell 
like a story about the art like why what That's was the cool. artist's motivation and we what were they too. what period was this in this this artist's career and so and then it becomes like derivative of like you start building these stories for these artists the last time i played was at a convention pre-pandemic and the the newest version of the game that's out by Come On Games or Simon or whatever they're called now. They've changed their name a bunch. Whatever <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> their and, uh, a friend of, the of mine, is, yeah. yeah. One of the artists was just like he just put it down and he was like, "Bendy Girl goes to the store." And so then every time that artist came out, it was Bendy Girl does something right. else. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's so funny. <laughs> Okay, Rippy, kind of tell me you've played this game. Please, you've played this game. <laughs> Rippy, do you want to be the, the walk of shame this time? Yeah, I'll walk it. I'll walk it out. We've got one more to walk out after this one, and we're home free. So. <laughs> it's a financial game that we've played that we will talk about. Yes. I've got one yeah. coming. I, I threw one in. Yeah. For the, for Jordan the just wanted to make us look bad. I'm going to let them... I'm yeah. let them steer the ship on that one. I got to tell you guys, this is a fantastic game. We played this yeah. at, we played this at everything from family game nights to guys game night, family game night. And by the way, Jordan, your rule about having to describe the painting becomes the fun of it. Otherwise it's kind of a mathy. I mean, it can feel like mm -hmm. a mathy game, mm -hmm. um, but man, yeah. I got to tell you when you're playing fast and loose and you're just, people are picking an artist and they, we went down to Michael's, and we bought a little easel <laughs> and, awesome. and you put yes. the, and it's like a $3 easel and you just put the thing on the easel. And then you have to talk about what the artist was thinking and all this stuff. Yeah. And I got to tell you at family game night, those are fun. And we laugh our heads off at guys game night. Those discussions are disgusting. <laughs> like what, the, oh, what, sure. what the artist was thinking <laughs> is, right. is totally not fit for radio. Um, <laughs> in, <laughs> in my copy of the game, a friend of mine went to like a party goods store and bought a pack of squeaky gavels. So I have a squeaky gavel in the box for my game. So when you're auctioning, wait, 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 wait. Oh, that's on that. the squeaky oh, gavel on the table. It's a so, really awesome game and multiple people over the years on this same segment have said modern art that's the game that just keeps coming i mean that's a great game we got two yeah, left i would have for you guys would be do they change the art for the paintings each time the new a new edition comes out yes like is it rotating out okay yeah it's different art it's different it's artists cool. boy that's good because mine jordan mine is the old uh, mayfair one um, okay. and, and the art is horrible. It just is absolutely <laughs> horrible. Well, I think I saw it. You can get this, this new one is, I think it's on Amazon for like, yeah, it's twenty nine ninety three right now on Amazon. Maybe I'll give mine away to some listener. There you go. And give me an excuse to have to, have to buy a new one. Oh, yeah. sorry. Yeah. I, I gave my old copy away. <laughs> All right. We're down to two left. What you got for us, Jordan? All right. I'm almost positive these guys have not played this one. <laughs> this one's called Panamax. Wow. You heard of it? I not only heard of it when this game was coming out, I actually at a convention. Okay, guys, here's, here's my nerd card right now. I actually <laughs> play tested this game before it came out. If it's the game about taking freight through the Panama Canal. That's the one. I, mm -hmm. I played this game. I really liked it. I think it's it's really interesting. So yeah, like Joe said, you're you're moving freight through the Panama Canal. Each person's operating a company, but you're also managing your own personal money. You win the game by having the most personal money. Doesn't matter how much money your company has at the end. There are shares of the companies that you can buy, so you can buy someone else's share. A really cool thing about with the Panama Canal is if you're moving through some of the locks. As you move through, if there are ships in front of you, they have to move too because of how the Panama Canal is designed. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then there are some some lakes in the middle where you're able. Once you get to that point, you can then pass. You know, move around, like get out of my way. Right, you put that you put that barge in high gear, right? And get right. it going like twenty. <laughs> get that <laughs> gear going, and then you can also load your cargo onto other people's ships. So then you're kind of like, we're, we're in this together. You, <laughs> you help me, I'll help you kind of deal. Like mm. we're in this together now. 
I think it's really interesting. And I, I do like the the next step of it's not just about your company getting a huge pile of money, but you also then have to figure out how to get that money to your personal yeah. stash. Like if you can have your company pay out dividends or if you get an end game bonus card, that's going to let you pay yourself a nice big payday. Out of all the ones that we've talked about so far, I, did, I haven't played the estates, but the other two, this game is way more involved Oh, than yeah. those games. Mm-hmm. But for people like, like I love logistics. I just like logistics puzzles. I think if I hadn't become a financial planner early on, and then, you know, this big podcasting thing I'm doing for all the big money that we make doing this, <laughs> we, we, I would, mm-hmm. I would totally have gotten into logistics and anybody that has mm-hmm. that engineering mentality and just likes that, that scratches that itch for me. I don't know about for you, Jordan, but for me, just mm-hmm. the idea of getting stuff succinctly through that canal and then the mm-hmm. problem of turning it from company money over to my money is mm-hmm. just, I don't know, makes my head hurt in a really fun way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You roll a bunch of dice and they get moved out on the board and that's going to tell you what actions you can take by plucking the dice off. So ones, twos, and threes are going to be allocated to movement, like moving ships along the, the Panama Canal. When you take movement, you have to use all of the movement. So if you've moved your ships and got them where they need to go, if you still have movement left, you have to move someone else's yeah. boats along. Yeah, so and then like, you're deciding I, you're deciding the, the lesser of evils, right? Right. Who do I help here? <laughs> or at the end of a round, based on where your ships are, you have to pay like cargo fees. Yeah. So sometimes you can try and, oh, you're let's just move you into this high cargo fee area <laughs> right at the end of the round. And then... <laughs> some colorful language and some, some things get thrown at you when you do that, but (laughs) ensues, it is a, it's a really fun game. You know, when you play test these games, they're expecting feedback. And Mm. I remember Steven Bonacor at stronghold games asked me what I thought about it. And I gave him this great feedback. I really liked it. (laughs) (laughs) And that that was it. That was it. I'm like, you're, you're welcome, Joe, dude. I think I saw that quote on the box. <laughs> right. I think it's on, it's on the back. Joe I says, really liked I liked it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I felt really dumb. I'm like, I should give him something like something. I don't really know about this. I couldn't do anything. I was like, this is a great yeah. game. All right. We got one That's more. Why Jordan. Yeah, yeah. That's why Jordan gets all our review copies because <laughs> my quotes would just be like, it has cool art. <laughs> well, we, I'm into. So. I wish I had time to play it. Right. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> all right. Well, the last game, I'm going to let these guys, people are probably sick of hearing my voice. I know I'm, I'm sick of hearing my voice, but the last game we have is Stockpile. So, Rippy and Connor, why, why don't you tell the good people about Stockpile? Well, we've actually played this one. (laughs) Yes. And uh, last time we played it was together. And Rippy won, which Rippy always wins. So don't let his calm demeanor fool you. He's very (laughs) cutthroat in games. But Stockpile (laughs) Stockpile's brilliant. I mean, it is the stock market board game that's out there. You've got Mm. four or five, I think it's five different companies, maybe six. I don't know, but they they represent different sectors like technology, automotive, electricity, and, you know, fossil fuels, that sort of thing. And so you just sit there and, and you're bidding on stock and your, you know, different stock packages that you can get. And, and the whole point is to have the most money at the end of the game. And you basically, you sell off all your stock and, whatever and it's a really fun and quick game like truthfully you you it's you don't sit there for hours on end Mm -hmm. playing it it's it's quick and you've got in my opinion a very stressful like a good stress though it's like you're sitting there and you're like okay is is eric or jordan or whoever you know at your table are they gonna bust automotive which i've got six you know split stock in and that's my my entire portfolio is riding on this one company and you've done so the opposite of what they tell people to do decisions yeah you've done the opposite kind of yeah, what exactly. they told you to do well, they say always oh, diversify and you're riding on one company yeah. everything eggs <laughs> eggs firmly at in See, one basket <laughs> yeah so obviously don't do that if you t- if you want to talk strategy talk to joe or jordan because <laughs> I'm, I'm not the stra- strategic one but yeah rippy what else what else you want to add this game is 
it, in my opinion, this is like a collection essential for people who maybe are more into board games and want to start building a collection to play you know, on game night with their buddies or their spouse or whomever. But uh, this, in my opinion, is a collection essential. It's got a theme that is unlike most others. It's just very direct in the stock market theme. Yeah. What about you, Rip? Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. Everybody would say that, man, I wish I could play the stock market in real life like being able to put money in and, and you know, it's, it, it's a gamble, but it's like a fun gamble. You know what I mean? Until you lose all your money. But I think with this game, yeah, it, it's a collection essential. I talked about it on the podcast on the no cube zone where we talked about this game. I don't think I've played a board game where I felt exhausted after playing like I did with stockpile. And it's like only like, like 40, 45 minutes. I mean, it is yeah, not a long know, game. It is not a long game. game. Yeah. yeah. But it's, high high energy i don't say high stress i don't want to turn people off but it's high energy the whole time thinking okay do i need just like he conniff was saying do i need the cell right now okay i'm gonna push it one more round i'm gonna do it one more round i know i can make it and for instance we played a game with our, our buddy eric and thank goodness like i made it and i just sold some of the stock like i had like three or four stocks and one which as you just said you're not supposed to do it's just how it lined up and like he, <laughs> he he busted that that stock, like thankfully it didn't hurt me too bad, but it hurt a little bit. And so it's just that whole time, um, like one of the cool things is at the beginning of each round, you get to know a little bit about the stock market. So each person in the game yep. knows some information about the stock market. There is a little bit. It's, it's like your little piece of illegal insider trading. Yeah, 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 that's absolutely. that's good. Yeah, the, yeah. the thing is, it's you're a little bit of inside trading <laughs> on this one, so <laughs> yeah. But but like with that, that adds a little bit. Okay, like Conniff knows something, so why is he selling everything that he's about to sell? Does he know like it's about to go bankrupt? Yeah, it keeps you on the edge of your toes, which I think for a lot of people that maybe aren't into the board game hobby, they don't want to sit there and and play a super crunchy game yep. that you know something like the four of us might enjoy. But like with this game, it's a continual, you're going all the time. Like my, that's how my wife is. If it's not going, she kind of gets bored a little bit. Oh, but you're like, in it all the way. Yeah, I mean, all the way you're, you're the leaning time. forward. Yeah. Yeah. So yep. great the, game. The first time that uh, we played this game, I'm from Detroit. And uh, what's the automotive one called? American what, Automotive. Um, American yeah. American yeah. Automotive <laughs> would not stop going bankrupt. And, it, <laughs> and I got it when this game first came out, which wasn't that long after the auto companies were going bankrupt over and over. In and, real life. <laughs> yeah. And all my friends were going, but how realistic is this game? Like, this is, this is incredible. Some sort of Jumanji effect. <laughs> yeah, it, was, <laughs> it, oh my it was unbelievable. Stock split. But, but you'll... You you will have, you'll have a stock that splits. So you, you, mm-hmm. you now have double the shares. It goes up then. And now you've got a ton of money in this one company and then it goes bankrupt and you're sitting mm-hmm. there knowing that you could have won the game and the stock mm-hmm. goes down the toilet and there it goes. There goes yeah. that. You, you I, all, uh, d- another thing for our fans, for the money nerds listening to this, the fact that you're avoiding trading fees as well. Like there's, yeah. yes, that's so true. You can see there's these cards you can play on these stacks and there's trading fees and you're like, Oh, I don't want those trading fees. Forget about that. Mm-hmm. And there are, I, I love the, uh, all the player powers. So there are famous investors yes. that are, you can play as player powers. I think there's one that was, I think Bernie Madoff, you can turn the trading fees into positive cash. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That's, have you played yeah. with so, so you've played with the player powers because they put oh, that yeah. in the box you can yeah. also flip over the board and play where different companies have different um mm-hmm. yeah i love that side of the board as well because they uh it, i feel like it's even like more thematic because like the cosmic computers the tech companies can go up real fast but they can also crash right. real fast yeah. mm-hmm. the steel company yeah. like pays a solid dividend every time and that's a lot of fun that side where all the the different companies are all kind of varied. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, that's the only side I've ever played with, with the varied sides. Oh, And then with player powers, the last time we played with Rippy here, I had Bill Gates. And so he just starts out with 30 million money, straight money. up. And, yeah. Because so. <laughs> <laughs> once again, the, that's where we all start. Is. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, 30 million. <laughs> and so, well, Jordan's in Omaha. So he starts with uh, Buffett, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think it's yeah. uh, I think it's billionaire Buffett in the in the yeah. game or something like that. How fun would that big. be though to have Warren come over to your house or board game night? 
like that would be. <laughs> yeah. Hey guys, this is Warren, my friend Warren. Yeah. Hey Warren. Whatever. <laughs> Can we just call you might, War? Right. I, I might get him if I tell him I, I'll buy the Cherry Coke. <laughs> yes. Or or Dairy Queen for everybody. Right. right yeah. <laughs> Got DQ. Yeah. Uh, guys, we're going to take a break here for a second. We have an exciting middle of the show. Believe it or not, one of the fastest growing companies on earth is a board game company. They have this subscription board game called, well, it's not even really a board game. It's it's kind of a, just a get together. There's not really a board. It's called How to Hunt a Killer. And we're going to talk to the founders here in just a second. Well, do you own or rent your home? Sure you do. And I bet... It can be hard work. You know what's easy, though? Bundling policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renter's insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you already have so much to do around your home. Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. And on my dad, shortwave radio, I'm so happy to talk to them. The people behind the company, believe it or not, it's a game company that's number six on Inc.'s list of fastest growing companies in America. CEO Ryan Hogan and uh, director of creative, the vice president, I think, of creative is the official term, Derek Smith. How are you guys? Good. Thanks for having us, Joe. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'm so happy you're here with me. Ryan, let's start with you in the company. It must be thrilling and surprising to find yourself that high up on a list when you're running a company making games and doing entertaining things. Yeah, I mean, it's been an incredible journey. You know, Derek and I started this company back in 2016. Um, and this certainly wasn't our our first journey or or step into the business world. For us to be able to start this as, as a live event, bringing hundreds of people together on a 200-acre campground that we had transformed into a living crime scene, and take that kernel of idea and uh, and transform that into the sixth fastest growing company has been validating, you know, validating for the effort, the blood, the sweat, the tears, uh, you know, that we've put into this thing over the past few years. Derek, tell me about the live event, because I didn't know this, what Ryan's talking about. Did you guys, I mean, how do you engineer that type of thing? Tell me about creating that. Very carefully. Um, <laughs> we ended up having a, I want to say it was like 600 participants. 600, yep. We set it up as a as like an interactive theater combined with an escape room, except you were dealing with multiple buildings. As soon as participants arrived, we were there handing out missing person flyers and telling them where to park, saying, okay, you're you're in this universe now. The game has started before you even get out of your car. It was a lot of fun. We hit our numbers, we hit the success rate we were we were aiming for. It was a bunch of like like how many miles, how long will it take for people to get from point A to point B and solve these puzzles? And then we ended it all with a a strange stage performance that I think it landed pretty well, uh, but <laughs> it did not land well. Let's be, let's be clear about this. It did not land well. We had... Yeah. Derek, you got to tell the whole story because I forget what song he was dancing to, but we had the murder come out on stage and like take off his clothes and start dancing to what? <laughs> what was it? It was For the Longest Time by Billy Joel. And then he threw uh, um, blood all over the place as he sawed the woman in half. On, it was it was great. It was all like from a story standpoint, it all connected. It all made sense. When we just say that part, it sounds insane. But the thing that we did figure out was this is not sustainable. We can't run around the country putting on 600 person events. We can deliver an immersive experience without having to hold live events once a month, something like that. So that's how we got into the subscription business. Wow, that's incredible. And then Ryan, how many people work for the company now creating these games and sending them out? Yeah, so we've got about 62 people between Seattle and uh, and Baltimore, and then we we still do our own warehouse. So you know, between temp and part time, we've got about 100 people that are cranking every single day at Hunt to Killer. Wow! And based on what Derek just said when he was talking about success rate and hitting your numbers, like you guys are very serious about your clowning around about your games. It isn't just coming out naked and singing Billy Joel. It's it's you're 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 really running a business. 
It's a real business, even, uh, but it's a fun business, right? Like how many others can make that claim that, that you just made? So <laughs> yeah, it's a great journey for sure. Well, that's what I love about the game and, and actually the f- field of work that you're in. Cause I mean, what I brag about is I have a podcast where I get to make myself laugh all day. Like how many people get to say that? I think it's you guys and me and not, not a lot of other people. But, but Derek, let's transition to you because I played the first couple episodes of Hunt a Killer. And uh, I got to tell you, the I don't want to spoil everything for people, but you guys have made this really immersive. Talk about the design of the game and really where the ideas came from to, to design Hunter Killer. Yeah, definitely no spoilers. We spent the last four years creating a, a team of writers and graphic designers, and then we have our ops and, and they source some fantastic items. Well, we start with a story and we, we try to identify characters that are going to have an impact on the player, definitely raising the stakes of the story, and then coupling that with a game design that is, the idea behind it is, okay, it's a mystery. The player wants to solve this mystery. They need to find out certain information, and then they do their best to solve the mystery. I'm wondering, is the creator of the game, Derek, then, do you just, because as, as I went through it, and I will talk a little bit about the very beginning of it here in a second um, and ask you some questions about that, like what was in my first box. I won't tell everything, but I do want to give people kind of a feel of, of what they get. You start off by laying out all the different uh like what I'm going to get in box one, what I'm going to get in box two, what I'm going to get in box three and kind of pace out the story first. Or did you, did you have a, a big idea for the game and, and work backward? Tell me about that. Cause I'm just, you know, after I played the first two, I started wondering like how on your end, do you even begin laying this whole thing out? Uh, so we end up going through a couple of different phases. I don't, you know, we don't want to give away the secret sauce necessarily, <laughs> but we start with the story and then it's a matter of, okay, you know, let's establish the full season arc. We call our, our six episodes a season. And then we look at each individual episodes, making sure that the, uh, make sure that the player has a win, yeah. you know, uh, many wins along the way, but they have a really big win at the end that can progress the mystery get them to the next episode. I really Um, like that, by the way, Derek, not to cut you off, but I really like that at the end of episode one and episode two, I felt like we solved something. There was definite, I definitely had a, had a feeling of completion. My son who's visiting and my wife and I were high-fiving each other that we solved the first mystery and the second one. So that was great. But also what was funny was, and I will give another, one other spoiler after episode one, I then got an email from people inside the game, from characters inside the game, moving me into episode two. I thought that was pretty wild. Definitely. Yeah. Obviously we're a subscription business. We want the player to be ready to move on to the next episode, but it is really important to feel like, Hey, I've accomplished something and Oh, I've learned something new. My perspective on this story has changed. And now I have a new mystery to solve in the next episode. Uh, uh, Let's talk a little bit about just the beginning. So the mystery, I'm just going to lay out, if you guys don't mind, just a little bit of of what the first mystery is, because I think most of this is on the website anyway. So uh, we're working with a private detective. I believe her name is Michelle Gray. I don't have it in front of me. And Michelle's doing something else that needs my help, right? Needs Cheryl and my son, Nick, and and my help. And so uh, she sent us this box and I opened the box and there's some notes there. And inside the notes, you're right. Some of the notes are handwritten. Some of the things are, uh, there are reports from the police. There's reports from other individuals. There's some old letters I just can't imagine the amount of creativity that's on that team, Derek, that put that box together. Tell me a little bit about the types of different people. You told me that you've got some writers, some actors, but how hard was it finding this cast of characters? You know, I just like the business has grown, our processes have have grown, but we found some really talented people early on. And then we've just kind of built from there. We have a great team of graphic designers. I I think especially with Curtain Call, the season that, that you're speaking of, the aesthetics of the, the product are, are really fantastic. And our goal here is to, to be as immersive as possible. So we are looking to be as authentic as we can. You know, even the right indent from a typewriter is something that we, right. we really take notice of. And, that, and that's what we're trying to produce. Well, and the funny thing for me is, is that, and once again, not to give things away, but everything matters. 
some stuff is out wide in the open and other things we kind of had to search for it. But man, you get the aha and you go, oh, okay, I, I got it. That was really neat. Ryan, back to you. How many, how many seasons of Hunt a Killer are there? And I know you guys also have, it, it looks like there's other brands too that people can jump into other stories now. Yeah, there, there are. So we actually start shipping uh, season nine next month. So our most mature cohort of members will start receiving that next month. Um, but all of our members start at the same spot. So um, and we move that spot just because we get we get better at developing these types of immersive experiences every single year. So we tend to move that starting point um, each year. So right now, everybody starts on an, a, on a season called uh, Curtain Call. And that's probably what, what you're enjoying right now. But we do have other products, and we actually just launched another subscription product in partnership with Lionsgate. So we have a Hunt a Killer Horror subscription <laughs> um, that ships out Blair Witch. And it's the same sort of mechanics of storytelling. Because, you know, when Derek talks about the writers and, and the designers and the, the attention to detail that goes into every single game, that's our differentiator. You know, earlier you were talking about, you know, sometimes um, folks go to Target and they see a game on the aisle yeah. um, and they're getting something for Thanksgiving and they, you know, they typically don't pick a very good game. And now they're just like they're over the whole tabletop gaming industry. Our approach to gaming is very different. It's always story first. And it's always about that character development and finding different types of topics and characters and, and things that, that we believe will resonate with the audience. And, and then it's about transformation of that story into some sort of experience where we gamify that story and really start to focus on what are those authentic items that we can put into this experience where we can distort reality for our members. And so, you know, that's what goes into to every single box. And now we've got the Hunt to Killer Horror. And ironically enough, we're sitting on the shelves of Target, um, which we're very excited about with our newest product, Death of the Dive Bar. That's, that's awesome. The Lionsgate thing. I can't let that go. How did that tell me about the, the germ of that? Did they come to you and say, hey, let's develop a game? Did you guys reach out to them? Tell me about hooking up with Lionsgate. I think we always knew. So we are amazing storytellers and we've got a very talented staff of writers and creators. We always knew that our core differentiator is the translation or transformation of stories into immersive experiences. And so we knew that regardless if it was a story coming from, you know, internally or if it was intellectual property that already existed, that presented a real opportunity for us from a growth standpoint, whether it's you know, reducing customer acquisition costs through the brand awareness or, you know, leveraging the brand awareness of other franchises um, or their audiences that already exist. So we had this idea for the past few years. We had reached out to a few folks. Um, I, I, Game of Thrones sticks out just because when we reached <laughs> out to them, uh, we were very early days and, and they pretty much told us. To I can't off. imagine, by the way, Ryan, not to cut you off, but I can't imagine yeah. that Thanksgiving dinner. Right. I mean, thinking about the Red Wedding. Like, yes. no, 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 I don't want to play that game. <laughs> I like my relatives. Exactly. But I think once we really started to establish credibility in the industry and get the momentum and traction that we had with the Hunt to Killer brand, we were able to get the right folks on, on the calls. And so I, I think Lionsgate came up through a mutual connection. You know, we're, we actually just licensed uh, Nancy Drew. So on hopefully Walmart and Target shelves next year, um, we'll have a Hunt to Killer Nancy Drew edition. That one came to us, but we're always looking for great intellectual property that we can help monetize and bring a new perspective to that story. When you talk about keeping customer acquisition low, all of our money geeks, you know, that listen to this most of the time, not just the board game episode, I'm sure got really interested in that, that phrase and that metric is what you're trying to say. And this may be a shock, Ryan, that, that what you're trying to do is make a game that's so good that people talk about it. So you don't have to pay a lot for marketing. You're actually going to make the product really good. Is that what you're actually talking about? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it always starts with product. And I think that's what a lot of folks get wrong. Like, you know, anybody can start any company and spend a boatload of money getting acquired or getting customers, acquiring customers. But what really matters is what's the sustainability of that. You know, for us, we took a large focus on building community in the very early days because we knew that bringing folks together to have conversations, whether it was, hey, look at my cat in the box or look at this piece of evidence. Can you help me through this? You know, and these conversations are happening constantly on Facebook. We've got one hundred and thirty 
thousand people in this secret Facebook group. Um, and there's more dogs dressed like detectives than, than I care to say <laughs> on your show. But I mean, this has been a huge driver in sustaining profitable customer acquisition costs, even as we've continued to scale the budgets. Today, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars a day in performance marketing while retaining you know, our target customer acquisition costs. And so you have to continue to think outside of the box when it comes to those types of strategies. Derek, back to you for a second on the creative of all these things that Ryan's talking about. Do the games generally follow a uh, method that you thought about ahead of time? Or are there times when it just surprises you, the things that come out? Like, does the game sometimes design itself because it wants to go one way, even though you want to go the other? I kind of wish they would design themselves. Um, <laughs> but uh, to speak to multiple iterations and and how we how we think about these games, a huge part of that is customer feedback. So from the very beginning, you know, uh, as Hogan mentioned earlier, we, we've done, uh, we're coming up about to release our ninth season. And if you look back at our very first season that we put out, it was just myself and our, our head writer at the time, Adam Muller, it was much, much different. So as we've collected feedback through the years, we've changed the game to make sure that we are giving the player the best experience. So we talked about wins earlier, that feeling of accomplishment. That wasn't always there. You know, we, we kind of thought, hey, we're going to throw them into this universe and it's going to be a little crazy and they're going to love it. And a small percentage of people did love it. But we quickly found out as we started getting larger amounts of subscribers, we're tiptoeing in the mass market and, and people are a little confused. So let's make sure that we're giving them a, like the best experience possible. I love that. Be open to feedback, revise, revise, revise. Last thing, Ryan, for you, people are going to play uh, the season that I'm playing or other products. Is there an optimal player count? I mean, we had a great time with three. About how many people do you think that have a good time? When's it too many? Yeah, this actually might be a better question for Derek. I, I, I think I'd probably say, say three to six folks. Derek, what do you think? That probably sounds about right. Uh, a couple of things that's nice is, especially in this environment, we get Facebook uh, feedback all the time of people playing this remotely, being able to share the documents, and maybe one person has a box, maybe both, either way. But I say, yeah, three, six. Yeah, I think it's just a great way. We were talking about this game, guys, and about how this can become a standing party, right? I mean, we got this group of people we get together with all the time. We make our way through the the episodes and have a great time. It's called Hunt a Killer. You'll find everything at huntakiller.com. Derek and Ryan, thanks a ton for hanging out with me and talking about hunting killers. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks, thanks a lot. If you pay your credit cards off every month, like you should, you want to hear something amazing? Discover matches all the cash back you earn on your credit card at the end of your first year automatically with no limit on how much you can earn. And how amazing is that? In fact, it's even more amazing because of all the places where Discover's accepted 99% of places in the U.S. to take credit cards. So when it comes to Discover, get used to hearing yes more often. Learn more at discover.com slash yes. 2020 Nielsen Report. Limitations apply. All right, and we got the No Cube Zone guys back for part two, and Rippy's already yawning, which is <laughs> which is a bad, 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 hey, bad side. You got to stay with us. He probably man. just is yawning because he got tired of listening to me drone on about <laughs> financial games. Yeah, but he's I'm not just, playing. I'm just happy that you had us back after the break. Personally, <laughs> wow, these guys don't play board games. Yeah, that's what right. are they even talking about? I thought they had a board game podcast. <laughs> but you've been nice enough to create another top five list, and these are five games that don't stink. Because as you guys know, before you got into the hobby, what do people do? They go to Walmart, they go to Target, and they just look for games. Yep. And you look at the cover mm-hmm. art, and as you know, some of the cover art's pretty good that has a really horrible game behind it. Or a lot of families go back to Monopoly, which stinks, um, or or Life or Payday or, you know, any of these I, old time games. The last time I was in Target, I always go through the game section because I'm addicted. Um, yeah, so I can see what they have. You're contractually saw, obligated. Right, yeah. <laughs> I saw there was some... I can't remember exactly what it was. It was some, like, abomination. It was, like, a combination of monopoly and trouble or like there were like mashup games that they like we're mashing these two games together and they're sitting back there on the shelf i was like no does that ever work i'm trying to think of two games that they put together that ever work 
There was a card game of Monopoly called Free Parking that I played my kids when they were young that was actually pretty decent. Hmm. Um, I've heard the Monopoly deal card game is okay. I have heard that from other people as well, that that, that, that's a pretty good game. I have that. That's the best way to play Monopoly. If you're at our stage of addiction, I should. (laughs) (laughs) Are there stages? This isn't like a 12-step program, though. No, (laughs) it's full blown. What are you talking about? It just depends on how far down the rabbit hole you've gone. That's right. Well, let's take people a little further down the rabbit hole. So you guys have been nice enough because you know games very well. Games that uh, if we do have a holiday gathering this year or at some point in the future, we ever have a get together again. (laughs) Yeah. How do we not waste our money? So, uh, Jordan, what do we got here, man? The first game that I've got on our list here is a game called The Quacks of Quedlinburg. Mm, So good. It's a mouthful, I will admit. So the the premise of this game is you're all there's a like a potion brewing contest, I believe, in a town called Quedlinburg. And so each person is you're mixing up these potions. And so what it really essentially boils down to is it's a push your luck game. Everyone has a bag with these ingredients, and you're drawing these ingredients out that have numbers on the on these little chips. And you put these ingredients in your pot. If your pot ever exceeds seven cherry bombs, your pot explodes. So you're trying to get as many ingredients into your pot as possible, which will get you points and money to buy more ingredients. But at the same time, you don't want to explode because if you explode, then you lose the ability to either get points or buy more ingredients. You like this game, Conniff? Oh, yeah. There's a lot of bang for your buck in this box too, because yeah. it's what thirty to forty dollars. Which I don't know how. Like maybe like new people, that's a lot of money for board games. But it's really not. Like when it comes down to how much you get in this, like each ingredient you can buy has two different sides with two different powers. So you know, let's say you go and buy the orange ingredient. You know, one game you're playing with one side another game entirely you could play with the opposite side and the powers do something different so you're building your bag with all these ingredients that will help you get as far along your track as you can go and get more points and then you know more money to buy more ingredients and so on and so forth and so it's it's a lot of fun and it's quick too i mean i don't know what your guys play counts are with like two people like how long you're playing but in my experience, it doesn't take a long time and everybody does everything at the same time. So there's not a lot Mm -hmm. of downtime, which as Rippy mentioned is a plus for those spouses who like mine have had a baby and have no energy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and also Rippy turning to you, it sounds like there's a lot of laughing in this game because we play push your luck games and you finally explode everything. Like we always crack up. (laughs) Yep. Oh man. There's, there's words that fly around. There's i uh, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And then the hand pulls out of the bag and you did it. Yep. Yeah. There's a lot, especially when me and my wife play, this is probably one of her favorites. When I first got this, we played and I think we had done about midnight. She's never done this before. And I don't think she ever will again. She goes, let's play again. At so midnight. Played, at midnight. This is how awesome my wife is. FYI. And so we played another <laughs> one. We probably played that game five or six times within the first week that we had it again, just like Connor said, like full of re- replayability, like you don't get tired of it. And I've introduced this game to four or five people that like don't play games, including some of my in-laws and they, I mean, fell in love with it, wanted to play it again and again. So yeah, it's a push your luck. You're gambling with what you're pulling out of your bag, hoping you don't explode your pot of stew or whatever you want to call it. And sometimes you do potion. That's the word. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's basically like uh, going to Vegas, right? Only in your own home. (laughs) What's the bottom end age on this, Jordan? I have played this with my six-year-old daughter. You have to help her a little bit with kind of reminding her of the potions and things like that. But I mean, she kind of gets it and she is able to make her own choices on whether she stops or not. Mm-hmm. Um, takes a little bit of hand holding, but I would say probably like a an eight year old is probably going to get this and run yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah, this is a game that I resisted for a long time just because I thought the name was stupid. Oh yeah, I was like <laughs> Quacks of Quedlinburg. I don't want to play a game called Quacks of Quedlinburg. 
But man, kind of the way you glow about it, like um, I heard so oh, yeah. many people doing that. I'm like, I got to buy mm -hmm. this. Yeah. And I don't even own it, but I, <laughs> it's an absolute must buy. It to me, this is like, I mean, we, we talk, we throw the term around like gateway game. Like this is becoming a new one, in yeah. my opinion, that's going to get, because it looks good, looks good on the table. And that's, that's obviously a huge thing to me. But like, if you're getting new players in, if it looks good, they're more inclined to like, okay, I'll give this a try. And Absolutely. so, yeah, I mean, new gateway game, whatever you want to call it. This I, is what I use to introduce people to gaming. I bought this for my sister, my sister, brother-in-law and my niece who are 12, but I bought it for my sister's birthday, sent it to them. It's been during COVID. They've taken pictures and they tell us how hilarious it is and how awesome it is. <laughs> I still haven't played it yet because I, you know, I can't get together with them for the holidays, which is yeah. frustrating, yeah. but yeah, that, uh, sometime a soon. A big thing I think about this game with, I think most all of these games is on YouTube there are how to play videos. So even if you pick this up and you're intimidated by the rule book, mm -hmm. if you just go to Google and or go to YouTube and type in how to play Quacks of Quedlinburg, if you can spell it, there are lots of videos that'll pop up. Uh, I believe Rodney Smith has one with Watch mm -hmm. It Played. He's he's really good at explaining rules and breaking it down easy yep. to understand. So if you go out and it's like, hey, I, there's no cube guys and Joe, we're talking about this Quacks game. You pick it up and if you feel intimidated by the rule book, there are great videos, like instructional videos, walk you through it. You can always check those out on YouTube. Yeah, Rodney Smith. I'm glad you brought that up, Jordan, because if you see a video, because you'll see a bunch of, believe it or not, everybody listening, <laughs> but, but because if you're not in this hobby, you would think that there's nobody explaining videos on YouTube. About board. There are crap loads of people <laughs> talking mm -hmm. about board games on YouTube. Uh, but if you see Rodney Smith's name, you're going to get a very succinct yeah. uh, mm -hmm. way how to play. And then, by the way, if you want to just watch it being played, a guy named Rado, like Rado's mm -hmm. videos out yeah. of play. I watch those things and he's so damned excited when he's playing the game <laughs> by himself, <laughs> by the way, yeah. pretending it's him and his wife. Yes. I, I think that guy yeah. like sleeps at like an eight out of 10 energy. That's, level. Right. Oh my he's gosh. Always That's like right. You can see that guy, Jordan, talking about Monopoly. And then I uh -huh. land on Boardwalk and it's phenomenal. I get all Jen's <laughs> money. It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I pass go. Then I collect two hundred dollars from Jen. She's mad about it, but who cares? We're still playing. <laughs> what? <laughs> Dude, I swear you sound. Yeah, I could have swear that was Rado right exactly there. Like him for, yeah. I know no one else will understand that, but oh my yeah, gosh! I just, I just love Rado's enthusiasm yeah. for board games. It's just mm. man, it's so fun. But it's infectious, yeah, yes, it is. Speaking of infectious. Let's do our second infectious game for people. Second non infect like not like COVID infectious, but no, uh, that's like right. fun infectious. Yeah. We, do I gotta back off that statement? Right. We uh <laughs> we picked it. Camel up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I have mm. not played this game, but this looks like a lot of fun. Who wants to tell it me is. about Camel Up? This was uh so Rippy's gateway for all of his couple friends and all that you know, quacks, mine camel up. I bring this out. If there's ever a group of people, cause it plays, is it eight. just six? I thought it went to eight. eight. Yeah. I was going to say, I think eight. it goes to eight. So anytime we have five or more people in most cases, those are people who aren't big board gamers. This is the game that gets put on the table and it gets played more than once in the same sitting. Mm -hmm. My mom has bought this game after playing it. Some family friends and a couple bought the game. I took this out for a work dinner get together and we played it. I mean, all you're doing is bidding on camels and it's all just pure luck, but it's, yes. <laughs> it's just an absolute blast because the camels can stack. And so let's paint a picture here. There's a pyramid in the middle where you put the dice. So it serves some function because you kind of shake it around and then pour out a dice. And that's which camel moves for that leg of the race and the camels can stack, like I mentioned. And so they, if it's on top of, let's say there's uh, the green camel and then the blue camel moves up and lands on the green camel space, it stacks on top of the green camel. So now for the sake of like, who's in the lead, the camel on tops in the lead. And so there's five camels. This lead can shift 
entirely throughout the entire game. And so, uh, you know, you might be three spaces from the finish line and you have four out of the five camels stacked upon each other. And it's just, <laughs> nobody knows what's going to happen. You've got somebody taking the, the camel that's, you know, another extra space behind all the way. And you're like, you're an idiot, but then they win and then you're the idiot. And it's just, <laughs> it's just so fun. It's, it's so much fun. It's so simple too. It's one of the easiest games to just look at, read the rules and be like, Oh, you can just play this immediately. So this sounds like Rippy, everybody standing around the table. Like you're not even sitting down. You're standing around the table yelling. Oh, 100%. I mean, when I, this game will infuriate you because like, because basically you put down a bet and whoever I can, you can put it down at the very beginning of the round. If you think this camel is going to, to win this leg of the race. So like the sooner you put your bet down, the more you'll win points or whatever money I can't remember. But yeah, so I mean, you you make a guess, and then all of a sudden, some idiot pulls out a dice with five camels on its back, and it takes out, and you get last. <laughs> I mean, you you get mad, you get a little frustrated, but it is. I mean, it's 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 a blast. Like Connor said, like most of the games that we play, you if you have more than four or five people, there's not a whole lot of games that we can bring out. So this is one that plays up to eight players. It's phenomenal. So much fun. A ton of energy. And like you said, I kind of said, you'll probably play it two or three times yeah. in one sitting. So. Yeah. Jordan, yeah. Jordan, you good at betting on the camels? <laughs> oh, no, I'm terrible. I'm awful <laughs> at this. Like, I'm always just like, yep, it's this. It's going to be orange this time. And orange is like dead last. I'm like, gosh, darn it. <laughs> For our friends uh, listening that are in Germany, you'll have to I'll have to apologize because I'm going to slaughter the the way that we I say these words. But there's a game of the year uh, award called Spiel des Jahres, and, mm. and, and I just slaughtered that, but uh, game <laughs> of the year. And um, I believe Camel Up won game of the year, didn't it, Jordan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So that was the original version, which had some controversy with how they printed the name on the box. Um, yep. Because the, the C <laughs> for Camel, it's a big C that counts for Camel and, and Cup or camel up so some people called it camel cup some people called it camel up they have rectified this in the second edition nerds infuriated everywhere right, right. yeah out. lots <laughs> lots of angry people went what to their do keyboards you call it? right <laughs> what's the name of the game the irony but, yeah. in this is that the people would complain or argue about this on the bgg forums which that's board game geek we haven't mentioned it yet but that's the the holy bible of mm. board games it, on the internet yeah speaking of when rippy's knocking on the door and he's letting them in that was me with board game geek in in 1996 <laughs> or 7 and man, that was a slippery slope. That was just, mm, oh, yep. goodness, I think. And then I bought Puerto Rico, a game that we don't need to talk about. And <laughs> I was lost, just gone. Good news for you, Joe, is they haven't changed much about the website since you started using <laughs> they, it. In the late yeah. That's true. That. That, that is true. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's another, by the way, anybody who's a nerd will go. <laughs> because to know oh, that, two in one episode to know jordan that that's funny that that's funny as all get out <laughs> you gotta be a super nerd so that's all yeah. of us all right but what do we I, got I, next i was just gonna say i think camel up is great because it does play up to eight people yeah and it's like 30 bucks even like like if you're talking like we talked about joe if it's like the holidays and maybe you're standing around having a couple uh couple spiked ciders or some wine this is a great game because you're just it's just like you're betting on camels. You're, it's a racing game. You're not racing as the camels. You're watching a camel race just like, let's throw mm. down, let's go. <laughs> I think this is also, though, I, I mean, this sounds like to me a game. There's a few games out there that are fun to watch other people play. Yeah. Like this is a game for people to stand and around watching other people play this, I think would be a hell of a good time. And I think this is the one you could even like, if you wanted to pull this out around like a Kentucky Derby party, right. like you could pull this out at that and just like, that could be like some of the, yes. the pre-derby festivities is uh, you could play some camel up. Having some camels. <laughs> Absolutely. Racing some camels. All right. What do we got next, my friend? All right. So the next game might be interesting to you, Joe, since uh, you and Cheryl have been uh, hitting up some of the national parks. It's a game called Parks. Oh, so oh, I haven't so good. I have not played this game, yep. guys. I played Trekking the National Parks. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. played that one, 
Um, but Parks looks really interesting to me. Tell me about yep. it. And it's so it's another one that is also available in Target. Like you can find this on the shelves at at the Target wherever closest to you. So you have two hikers that you're walking along a trail. Um, you're obtaining resources to then visit parks. So different different parks will have different requirements. Like if you want to go to the uh, Joshua Tree National Park, you'll you'll need different resources. Or if you want to go to Glacier, you'll need different resources. And then those each park is worth points at the end. You can also take photos along like there's an action where you can take photos of your and each photo is worth a point at the end of the game. The thing that drew me in is the art for this game is beautiful, beautiful art. There's an art series that they got the art from. You can get, yeah, the 59 parks print series. Is it like the 1950s looking art of all Mm -hmm. the different parks? Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, We've got, so they, there were like 12 of them, I think that were originally made back in like the the fifties and sixties. And then they had someone make them for all the different parks in like that stylized. Yeah. Like that same style. I mean, the game is just fantastic. Like the, the components are all top notch. Like there are, it comes with these little bit trays for the resources that are shaped like logs. It's just like a super high, like and everything fits like perfectly in the box. It's it's a super cool game. It's not very hard to learn because you're just, you're moving your guys along this path. You can't have people in the same spot on the path unless you extinguish your campfire. Everyone gets one campfire that they can put out per round so you can double up on a spot. I think Parks is great. Is this the kind, uh, <laughs> I'm assuming all three of you guys have played this one? No, actually, uh, this is, yeah. I haven't. Uh, I but to. Watched, gorgeous, but but Rippy, no. you've played it. So no, I have. I've watched a lot of videos of of get of it being played because I want. Sorry, this is on my again. Christmas list. Jordan so. picks a game that uh, no one else has played. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it without having played it, to me, if I can watch a video of like someone else playing it, and I'm like, I'm in. I want it. Like that to me is a good game. I'm a sucker when it comes to good looking games, and this is one of those. But it is like Jordan was saying, it's a simple game. Like you're you're just moving your guy, you're collecting resources and then spending those resources to visit or yeah, visit national parks. And so yeah. I, you're you're watching a video of it and you get the game. So it's not exactly. hard. Exactly. No, yeah. no, not at all. What's interesting, Jordan, to me is that this seems to me, and tell me if I'm wrong here, is this a game that kids could play with grandma and grandpa? Oh, for sure. It's not hard at all. And I, yeah, I think it would be one that kids and grandma and grandpa would enjoy playing together because, yeah, it's I think it's one that, yeah, they could sit down and they could play it. It's easy to understand. It's got some educational value, but it's not mm-hmm. like a, they're not trying to teach you about the national yeah. parks. It just is enough to draw you in and like. Hey, that's cool. I want to know more. That's yep. exactly what I love. Like when you say Glacier, like then the next time the kid sees Glacier National Park, they're going to go, oh, I know that. That's from that game I like. Mm-hmm. And then they want to explore more yep. later. Like we're not trying to teach all the stuff now. Let's just get yep. them build the thirst. That's that's fantastic. Yep. Yeah, yep. good stuff. All right. We got two more left. What's next on our list? We did an episode. Rippy was MIA for for some reason I don't recall in one of our Kid episodes stuff. on the no cube zone. And we Conniff and I did a uh, 16 game bracket of I like this episode of, uh, of, of games. So naturally I felt like I had to put the winner in here. And you had to. So game. these, th- these were like gateway, I don't think e- this like one won. easy yes, games, right? I think it was ticket to ride. No, this beat ticket to ride. Oh, Shows bring up you the how episode. much I know. Oh, Guys are going to fight I, right I in front of me here. I do listen to my own show, Joe. Yeah, <laughs> I'm gonna, I won't. I'll, I'll, we'll the, spare uh, you. I'll concede. <laughs> the, that's, that's never that's happened. Jim Calhoun, ours. that old coach for UConn, one of those press conferences is like, get some facts and come back and see me. <laughs> <laughs> you should just uh, uh, laying that out. These guys are getting salty. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but you guys did. You did a bracket. You did a we bracket. Did. And um, so tell me what we got. So we got Carcassonne. So in my house, just before you explain this, we started playing Carcassonne. For those of you that like games, uh, like trying out new games and, you know, we're in the time of COVID. We've been playing it on this site called Board Game Arena. 
my wife is getting smoked at carcass own lately on board game arena. So the second we finally got our stuff unpacked here in Texarkana, she's like, please take out a real version of carcass own so we can play. So at my house now we've played carcass own the real game. Tw- I haven't played the real game of carcass own. This game has been around for a while, guys. I haven't played a real game no. of carcass own in maybe 10 years and wow. we've played it twice in the last week. And my son is like, okay, now let's play because Carcassonne also has a ton of expansions. Mm-hmm. So he wants to play in the cathedrals. He also like, there's a funny one of, and, and I'll let you guys explain the game, but he, uh, there's one, there's one called the princess and the dragon where this dragon goes around eating all the people on the board, uh, which is, <laughs> which is totally random and not really a great game, but is funny to look at. So, right. but anyway, Jordan, tell us what, uh, Carcassonne's all about. So I think Carcassonne is great because it takes the concept of setting up a board game. You put the board on the table and then you do stuff on it. With Carcassonne, you're all building the board as mm-hmm. you go. Like that's the game is you're building the board. So it's a it's everyone's building on the same board. And so you'll on your turn, you'll draw a tile and it'll have different aspects to it. Like there might be a road on the tile or there will be part of a city or there might be an abbey. I think all of them now come with the the river expansion. I think that mm-hmm. they, they yeah. throw that one in there yeah. for you. So there's a river in there. And then, so when you're lining up the tile, you have to make it line up with the, the things that you're, you're placing it next to. It's like, if you're putting a road, it has to line up to another road that's out there or be placed. So it has the potential to be lined up with another road in the future. Same with the, with the castles you are placing your little meeples that I think Carcassonne is where the, the meeple term came from. I think that is uh, my people. They're just little wooden guys, the little wooden people. (laughs) They're cool looking. They Mm. are cool looking and they've really taken off in like the, the board game hobby Mm. is like a, that's like a thing people identify with is the meeples. So you put your little meeples out there on the road or the castle or the abbey and you'll build out your road. And once the road is completed, then you'll get your meeple back and you'll get a certain number of points. Like everyone's building at the same time. The abbeys are scored when that tile is completely surrounded by other tiles. And you'll get nine points, one for the tile that your meeple is on and then the eight surrounding it. You'll get nine points for that. There's also a farmer, which is kind of the, he's the long con. Mm-hmm. Um, a farmer you'll you'll put him down he'll lay down in a field i don't know why the game thinks that farmers <laughs> just chill in their lay in their field they're lazy you know everybody listen to who's a farmer andy i'm talking to you in vermont i'm sure andy you lay down in every field right. when you're <laughs> out there working in the field yep so the farmer you'll put in the field you won't get him back to the end of the game but the farmer will score three points for every uh, city or castle or whatever you want to call them in the field that is that that farmer is laying in. So that's a big way to score points at the end of the game. This might be sort of controversial, but when my wife and I play, we have never once played with farmers. Like we just excluded that. I think the first time I was trying to teach her, I excluded that from the rules. Yeah. From that day forward, we just never play with the farmers. Well, let's get right into it. Let's, let's get right into that kind of, because really what's funny about this game is while it's a, it is a lightweight game. It is an easy game to pick up. It is really fun for new people. This game, when you play it with people who played a lot can be just completely (laughs) effing nasty. (laughs) Yep. Oh, your yeah, wife my wife discovered that there are some sharks out there, huh, Joe? <laughs> yes. Yeah, when I play this game with my brother-in-law, speaking of my sister, my sister's husband, holy cow, he is always getting in on your castle, getting in on your farm, getting in on yep. your road. Like he's always up in your craw. My wife does yeah. not like that. She's like, I love this game. I don't like playing with him. So... <laughs> Yeah, it's nasty. I mean, that's kind of the thing Jordan didn't mention, but you can get involved in other people's castles they're building if you put a meeple down and they're not connected right away. And then all Mm -hmm. of a sudden you play another castle and, oh, now there's two different, you know, colored meeples conflicting for this castle. And and only one person gets the points on those. So you're, 
Well, I think there's there might be a tie. I don't I don't yeah, remember. If there is a tie, both people get them. Yeah. And then you can, yeah. uh, but you can basically build two separate castles, build them together into one castle, and then you have joint ownership. So you can kind of sneak in. You're getting your uh, points and everybody else's points when you do that. Yep. Yeah. Oh. But if you have more, then you we're get the our, points and the other loser call here. Lose out. It's so fun, and the basic game can be played. Once again, we talked about, Jordan, games that grandma can play with the kids. This mm-hmm. is a game grandma can easily play with the kids. You can play at guys' game night and just screw each other. I mean, <laughs> just just get so angry and flip the table because oh, yeah. it's bad. Like, this game goes from very fun and light to very mean and nasty with the same with the same pieces. Like, mm-hmm. there's no difference yeah. in pieces, just difference in attitude, I guess. Mm-hmm. I think it's fun too, because yeah, like there's a lot of fun in the base game, but then there are all these expansions out there. 50 million expansions. (laughs) You can add more stuff and more stuff and more stuff. They add like all sorts of like wacky tiles and there's stuff like the, because of the princess and the dragon. I think there's one where there's a catapult. I think you launch. The tower. I have that one. Mm. (laughs) You launch people with the catapult. You literally launch one of your little meeple wooden guys on there and you're trying to hit other people to (laughs) knock them off the board. Uh, no. just, it's ridiculous like, talk about stupidity like <laughs> these guys, I, I i seriously i really like this game i think it's great to be on the, it totally should be on your list i love it but i also think and i'm sure you guys do too that half of the expansions for this game are a total money grab oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Agree. inns and cathedrals is where it's the only one i have and that's where i would say yeah. You probably don't need any more, truthfully. No, that's true. And Inns and Cathedrals takes these basic things you do and it becomes double or nothing. Like it, mm-hmm. it basically yep. is doubling down on it. Yep, I'm going to finish this road or I'm not going to get any points. And so it just becomes a little bit more uh, hit or miss, but lots of fun. That's a great game. Uh, what there's, do we got next? There's one expansion. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's just one expansion. That's right. One of my friends has, there's another tile that's like cultists. And they are like in direct competition with the monasteries. So like oh, if dang. they get like if they get put uh next to a monastery and whichever one finishes first, like the other one gets canceled out. Like oh my goodness. That person gets zero points. Carcassonne with heretics. <laughs> like I just love that. Watch out, Mr. Monk. Yeah. I've <laughs> I actually I actually went to Carcassonne and and it, it is, it's uh, the reason this game has this name is because you got these roads upon roads upon roads, like the Romans started it and it's all these civilizations built on top of each other. And mm. so these roads kind of wind nowhere and uh, Carcassonne, by the end of the game, you're building a different, like Jordan, you said, it's going to be a different board every time. So, mm-hmm. all right, what do we got next? The last one that we've got is Disney's Villainous. This, game this, is, so this is another good game. This is another one you can you can grab at Target. So the premise of this game is you are playing as the bad guys from the Disney movies. So in I believe in the the base game you are there's Jafar, Prince John, the Queen of Hearts, Ursula, and I'm missing one. There's one there, more. But, is it uh, from the Lion King? No. Um, it's uh, uh, oh, it's no. the Queen Maleficent. of Maleficent. It's Maleficent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. In the game, you're playing oh. as one of these villains and you're trying to, you win the game by achieving what the villain is trying to achieve in the Disney movie. So if you're Captain Hook, you're just trying to defeat Peter Pan. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're Prince John, which is from Robin Hood, you're just trying to get a big old pile of money. Um, <laughs> so it's it's super fun. And then the the interactive part of it is is that um, you can play what's called the fate deck. So you can play the fate deck, which basically deploys the heroes of the movies to kind of gum up the other villains from completing the quest that they're trying to complete. So if I'm playing against Jafar, I can toss Aladdin and Jasmine out there to slow down Jafar from doing what he's trying to do. It is so funny yeah. playing as the queen of hearts. And when Alice gets played against me, 
by you, Jordan, or, or, or whoever you slap Alice in front of me, where in the real movie, you'll love Alice. You're like, <laughs> oh, you hate her. <laughs> you just hate yep. Alice is such a pain in the ass. <laughs> Every time anybody good comes out, the whole table laughs because we mm. all hate this good person. Like I don't, I don't want to yeah. see Prince Eric, uh, you know, in right. in Little Mermaid. I don't want to see that guy. He's a yeah. loser here, man. Yeah, <laughs> so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, probably... it's really fun. And then there are three or four expansions out now, which just add more, mm -hmm. more villains from the different movies. Like you can get scar from the lion King or Yzma from emperor's new groove, Cruella de Vil. And those can be played by themselves. You can just mix and match. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the cool thing. The expansions are, they can be played by themselves They're, and that would just be like a three player game. So might be good for uh, COVID times if you've only yeah. got a few people at home. Yeah. You can even just go pick up one of the expansions and it's just a good three player game. Rippy yeah. Disney did a good job with this one, I think. Oh man, they did. They did phenomenal with it. They were super smart about it because you have your base game, but now they can, they have so many villains within gobs and gobs of movies. They can continue to make expansion after expansion after expansion. But yeah, yep. this is by far, I guess like quacks and this one are probably the most played games in our, our household with uh, me and my wife. Um, we played this one. I mean, we've both played each character multiple times. We love it. We've got the base game and then the perfectly wretched, which is tugboat Pete. Uh, tugboat Mother Pete. Gothel. Yeah. Which all his cards are black and white, which <laughs> is awesome. And then Cruella, but yeah, it just the theme of it all. Each character has their own theme of what they're trying to do. So like you, you can play this game 12, 15 times and each time it's different because each villain is trying to do something different and how you do it. The mechanic of it is different for the most part. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Disney knocked this one out of the park and then some. That's what I like, Conniff, yeah, what, is that the asymmetrical nature, like everybody's yeah. trying to do something different. We're, we're trying to do the mm -hmm. same thing, but it's so replayable because you know, we play, I don't know how you play, but we play where we're drawing our, our villain at random. Mm -hmm. And so depending okay. on what villain I have, I've got to do something a lot different than I had to do the last game. Yeah. Asymmetrical is the word I was, I was going to mention if you didn't, it's every villain is different. Now there's some similarities, like for instance, Ursula has you, you need to find certain items to do certain things. And then Jafar is the same way. Like you need the magic lamp to then summon the G, you know, and do all this different stuff. But uh, we don't play, I mean, mostly I play two players. So just my wife and I, so I've got all the expansions. So there's what, nine expansion villains plus the six. So you've got your 15. Mm -hmm. Holy cow. Uh, I mean, I haven't played all of them personally and she hasn't played all of them so most of the time we are picking ones that we're interested in playing and so like i bought the the perfectly ratchet expansion recently and i played as mother gothel i think and she played as cruella de vil uh <laughs> and before that you know with the wicked to the core no that's that's another one anyway i played as uh the Yzma from Emperor's New Groove and she played as Scar. And so we were just experiencing these different villains and uh, trying to just see how they play and maybe who our favorites are. And, and the game does a great job in giving, it gives you a booklet and it kind of gives you strategy on what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And then like what cards will help you in that within your deck. Yeah. And so Super it's, helpful. it's a really fun game. My only caveat is, you know, with the Disney theme, and the villainous theme is more, it's more tongue in cheek. Like you're not like, <laughs> you're not like brutally murdering like the your your favorite Disney heroes, right? <laughs> but uh, I would still say this game is not really for kids because no. that asymmetrical gameplay is really yeah. hard to manage. Like I can't be, you know, here playing as, let's say Hades. And my, well, Rowan's only three, so that's that's a no-go yeah. anyway. But like, you know, a six-year-old or an eight-year-old, you can't be just helping them along because that's not the point of the game. Like you're you're trying to win. 
so it's kind of tough in that regard, but for adults and for people who maybe grew up with Disney or who love Disney anyway, and you've got all these classic movies and now you get a chance to be the villain and mm -hmm. have the movie <laughs> go the different way than it did. I absolutely love it, but I'm totally with you, kind of that um, that this is a 12 and up or 14 and up, which you don't think when yep. you see Disney, yeah. you think this is going to be yep. younger. Maybe that's why when I went to Disney Springs recently, just before COVID hit, like I didn't see this game in their toy store uh, mm -hmm. because, really? yeah, because I think I, I think a lot of parents would pick it up for a six year old or an eight year old and it just <laughs> doesn't, you know, not going to. That's a shame. Do. Yeah, not because it's a great game. It's a it is fantastic a, game. I love the but my favorite time playing this. I was playing the Queen of Hearts and your goal is to get all the card guards to turn into wickets mm. and then to take a shot yeah. and make it like through all your card. So you're trying to put your card guards out there. And I just thought this is just bizarre. It's so, yeah. yeah. I had to ban my wife from playing the queen of hearts because <laughs> she would always do it and she'd never miss her shot. It was, it was obnoxious. <laughs> I've always found playing captain hook very hard. Like captain hook. I, nobody yeah. in our family has ever won as captain hook. I don't know. Yeah. Captain hook's kind of hard. Yeah. Well guys, thanks a ton for hanging out with us tonight. This has been so yeah. fun. We gave people a lot of great uh, ideas. By the way, if you want links to all these ideas, and by the way, we're about to talk about the No Cube Zone for a second, but but if you want links to all this and the No Cube Zone, head to stackybenjamins.com and our, our show notes page. But you guys have a hell of a lot more fun on your show. I find myself on my runs <laughs> laughing at all the crazy stuff you guys do. Uh, tell everybody a little bit about, who wants to tell everybody a little bit about the show? I can Conniff. give Conniff the used, overview and then the Jordan can pipes. disagree with me. Yep. Now Jordan <laughs> will disagree with something I say. And then every, this every is podcast. The, it's the spirit of the show, really. So I say <laughs> something and it's wrong inevitably. And then we argue about it for 10 minutes. And then Rippy's finally like, let's move on. So no, <laughs> Rippy is no the peacemaker. Zone. More often than not, Rippy yeah. is the peacemaker. Yeah. Very much so. The whole idea came about because there's a ton of board game podcasts out there. There's always going to be. It's a very fun hobby and people love talking about games as you just listened. And so my my whole concept when I built this idea was I want to make a podcast that doesn't focus necessarily on the deep mechanical aspects of games where you're let's talk about the strategy for how best to uh, lay tiles in Carcassonne and steal castles from people. No, we just want to talk about our experiences playing games with other people because at the end of the day, board games are one aspect of this experience and the other aspect are the people you're playing with. Yeah. So that was kind of the driving factor of the show. And like I mentioned, Jordan and I will just argue about different uh, games and how I'm, uh, I draw weird conclusions apparently <laughs> where I'm like, this game reminds me of this game because of one little aspect of it. So I, I'll step out of the room and let them <laughs> say what they will about it. But, but that's the spirit of the no cube zone is yeah. Uh, I, talk about the experiences more so than the games themselves. I think you nailed it on the head. Like that's for me, that's my absolute favorite thing about the board game hobby is it's a vehicle to getting to interact with people. Yeah. Like the games are fun and like you want to play a fun game, but a lot of my memories center around the people that I played the games with, not the game themselves. I think back fondly of the game because it was the vehicle which led to this this fun time with my friends and it's led me to make new friends. I've met a ton of people because of board games, because these boxes full of cardboard and plastic. I, and that's and that's what I, I love about it. And that's kind of the, the spirit of the no cube zone is like we talk a little bit more about like the experiences that we've had and the the, the silly stuff that we've done <laughs> while playing the games. Oh, yeah. And and then, yeah, then Conniff and I get into arguments and, and Rippy's got to be like, guys, we've, we've been recording for an hour now and we've not talked about anything. Yeah. Rippy's like, hey, let's wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> no the funny thing about this podcast is there was a podcast before this called just the wisdom for wizards that me conniff and then another guy another buddy of ours that we did it and then it just kind of fizzled out and then 
it, it's just been fun starting this. Like I, I think talking about the experiences to me far outweighs the mechanics yeah. or like strategy, whatever you want to talk about. Just like they said, just because like, I mean, that's what, that's what life's about. And I think especially this year, like people especially. are realizing that, you know <laughs> right. what I mean? Like, yes. it's like, gosh, like this sucks. I don't get to hang out with people. Like I don't get to meet new people. I don't get to have these experiences. And so now like people are, are needing that even more. And so whenever this COVID thing ends, it's like, just go buy a board game and go play, go have some fun experience far out, far outweighs like anything else with this. And to me, like being able to, teach someone a board game i think that like you you guys would agree with this like you teach it to them and just like i talked with quacks immediately they go out and buy it you're like boom my job is done like <laughs> i did it and so i there's just no i mean there's there's definitely greater feelings i'm you know than this but <laughs> for uh, lack of a better phrase there's no better feeling than like get it, having someone like just get it and like yeah understand board games aren't just monopoly and board games aren't just for nerds aren't just dungeons and dragons whatever you want to say like board games are legit board games are fun they're cool like and you're just enjoyable it's better than just sitting there and watching a tv show for five hours straight or whatever yeah well said my friend all you guys conif rippy jordan guys thanks for hanging out with us and teaching our money geeks a little bit about board game geeks i really appreciate it dude thanks for having yeah, thank for you sure. for having us if anyone needs any further recommendations come bother us on our our social media channels we'll point you in the right direction for some other games if you're interested <laughs> that's a great idea i'm going to link to those too as well that's that's fantastic if you need holiday gift for, don't go to target and buy a game without talking to jordan <laughs> yeah. first don't right don't go buy the step in the poop game or whatever it is like, in the face there are so many games like because my kids know I love games and then they'll go to target and they're like, Oh yeah, let's look at this one. And there's, they have like 18 games where it's some sort of mechanism where you're like pulling teeth out of a shark or doing something. And then it's just like a jump scare. Like that's, there's like 18 of those games at target. And like, Oh, what about this game? I'm like, yep. That's the exact same as that other one. <laughs> it's just, it's, it's a mummy this time instead of a shark. <laughs> And there you have it, the authorities, with uh, some some fantastic board games. OG, what's your favorite board game to play with the family? This is a day when a lot of people play games. Why we do this episode? Yeah, I think we're you know we're partial to Ticket to Ride. That's kind of the top of the list when it's time to pull out a uh, a family game. The kids will get into Mr. Jack, which these are all things that you've put me on too. And it takes them like a cycle to remember how to play that, like how to kind of think backward. But once they get into it, then they'll whip through a couple, three rounds of that. You yeah, know. Mr. Jack, yeah. one guy is is uh, Sherlock Holmes. The other guy is the, I don't know, Mr. Jack, the... the Jack the Ripper. The, the, oh, yeah, that's right, Jack the Ripper. <laughs> and one guy's being chased, the other guy's the chaser, so it's a two-person... And you're really not Sherlock Holmes either, because Sherlock Holmes is one of the characters on there. Oh, that's right. But uh, you're trying to figure out who is Jack the Ripper, because Jack the Ripper is one of these famous characters. And uh, it's like a process of elimination and, you know. Yeah, fun, fun game. A Ticket to Ride, obviously the No Cube guys mentioned that game as well. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's a good one. That's a fantastic one. I said at the beginning of the episode that, that I was going to say why we do this episode today. We do this today because back in the day before we started this, we realized that before we started talking about board games, you and I had a powwow realizing that nobody, nobody really listens to a financial show on, on Black Friday. So why not make one that we enjoy? And yeah. then we found over the last few years, this episode ends up having a lot of listens, maybe because it's counter programming to, to what everybody else is thinking, uh, because there's nothing I want less. Well, in a normal year this year, I definitely don't want to go to the mall, but even in a normal year, nothing I want less on black Friday than heading to a shopping mall, sit me yeah. at home with family and board games. We're going to go. Now it's black plague Friday is what they call it. <laughs> <laughs> you go. It's a black plague. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh because it is so not funny, but it's a, a, a clever marketing. But if, but if there's like a big pile of people standing in front of Best Buy at 4 a.m., you know, I mean, I'm just saying. I wonder if though these people sanitize before the brawl to get the big screen TV. Can only hope. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from here, my friend. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? 
first, take a lesson from our board game discussion. There are games that can accomplish all sorts of things from teaching you about business and economics to good old family entertainment. But make sure to check the reviews and don't just get suckered in by a pretty box at the store. Second, take a lesson from Ryan Hogan in our Friday FinTech segment. Maybe it's time to surprise your family with a monthly game night. But the big takeaway? I think we can all agree that if 2020 were a game, we would have flipped the table over by now. Am I right? Thanks to Kniff, Rippy, and Jordan from the No Cube Zone podcast for helping us today. You'll find the No Cube Zone wherever you're listening to us right now. Thanks also to Ryan Hogan and Derek Smith for joining us to talk about Hunt a Killer. Want to try it out? Head to huntakiller.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Seahide, produced by Karen Rapine, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and if you could only know what it really smells like down here. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor.